Mr. Speaker, as I deliver my 2023-2024 budget address, we as a country have good reasons to celebrate. Because of the economic gains we have made, notwithstanding the external challenges and concerns about citizen security. In my maiden address last year, I reminded this Honorable House and the people of St. Lucia of who we are and what we stand for. Mr. Speaker, we have remained true to the principles that have shaped who we are and what we stand for. We have and have served us well. Inclusiveness, accountability, equity, meritocracy, and the rule of law. These principles, thankfully, have enabled us to protect the people of St. Lucia from the tidal wave of corruption, wastage, and inefficiency which has threatened to destroy our country until Redemption Day, July 26, 2021. Mr. Speaker, in planning for the growth and sustainability of our country, there are certain fundamental imperatives we must get right. The challenges of the day have informed the strategic choices of my government, choices that seek to secure a better life for our people. The strategic choices for the 2023-24 budget will focus primarily on three areas, health, national security, and economic sustainability, the theme for this year's budget. Mr. Speaker, as a government, our first responsibility is to ensure the safety of our people and the access to quality and affordable health care. The growth of a nation can only be powered by its people, who must be in good health if they are to be productive citizens. The ugly face of violent crime has been visited upon us, and while it is mainly localized, we cannot ignore the danger of contagion. This is why we must address it swiftly and decisively. We have and will continue to empower law enforcement with tough legislation in the battle against crime. As a society, we need to do more to discourage the glorification of crime and help our people develop respect for human life. Crime must not be allowed to find fertile ground in our homes, places of business, and recreational spaces. We must be of one mind in the fight against crime. Otherwise, it will, before long, destroy all of us. Mr. Speaker, as it relates to health care, the neglect and wastage of resources in the provision of health care during the last administration has left this government with a mammoth task. The citizens of this country deserve a much better health care system, and this government has committed itself to ensuring they get it. Our primary and secondary health care systems will all be improved over time. High on the government's agenda is, a, is the completion of St. Jude Hospital and improvements in the operations of the OKEU Hospital. Our success in pursuing these strategic choices will require sound and prudent management of the country's financial resources and contributions from everyone. Already, we have been experiencing improvements in the country's fiscal position, arising from initiatives we took last year. We shall, in 2023-2024, continue some of these initiatives while we adopt new and innovative ones. Mr. Speaker, the economic signs are clear. Our country is on a growth trajectory, and every effort is being made to keep it so. Mr. Speaker, we must be reminded that it was this government who was tasked with the handling of the Delta and Omicron variants and the full reopening of the country, having dispensed with all COVID protocols. And it was this government that had to grapple with the global effects of the Ukraine war, inflation, supply chain issues, and more importantly, the human and psychological fallout from the COVID virus on our people. And if the challenges were not enough, we had to deal with inflationary pressures from outside, driving food and fuel prices to very high levels. The price of crude oil reached a high of $123 per barrel, the second highest on record. 
not to be outdone by external negative influences, the last administration embarked upon the reckless accumulation of unnecessary debts, leaving the majority of St. Lucians feeling marginalized. This was the environment we inherited on July 26, 2021. Mr. Speaker, the economy then was in reverse, with a contraction over 20 percent, nearly four billion in debt. Investment was at a standstill, with not one new hotel built in five years. Mr. Speaker, the cancer of corruption was spreading, and spreading fast into our institutions. Over $300 million was spent on St. Jude Hospital, with no hope of reprieve for patients housed in deplorable conditions in the stadium. An airport overpriced and oversized, threatening to engulf the country into a further $1 billion of debt. The country's socioeconomic dashboard was flashing, life-threatening danger ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, 18 months later, we are experiencing a wellspring of economic growth. Unemployment is trending in the right direction, and there is a renewed feeling of hope in the country. We cannot now allow this renewal to be dampened by threats to our citizen security. We must therefore fight to keep our country on track and continue with the transformation that has begun. We have the people to do it. This budget will seek to reinforce those pillars for the continued renewal and transformation of our country. Mr. Speaker, this government continues to be guided and inspired by the philosophy and values of the founding fathers of our great party, the St. Lucia Labour Party. To open the doors of opportunity for every St. Lucian, irrespective of their social and economic standing in the society. Our party originated from the bosom of the labor movement and has consistently served the best interests of the workers in this country. We must continue to build a society where free enterprise can flourish and that the rights of workers are protected and they can get a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. We must build a society where meritocracy and inclusion are valued and embraced as basic principles for progress and development. Mr. Speaker, to ensure equality and fairness, the Minimum Equal Wage Commission is currently formulating a livable wage for workers in St. Lucia. All sectors, including the private sector, will be consulted and an appropriate announcement will be made. Mr. Speaker, we expect to commence negotiations with public officers in an amicable and realistic environment at the earliest possible time. Mr. Speaker, this government continues to build and gain the trust of the people by delivering on its promises. In my last budget, we promised and delivered paid facility fees for 24,000 primary and secondary school students procured 10,000 electronic devices for students under the One Laptop Per Child program, made available for 1,200 M5 devices to households to assist students with, with distributed learning, paid CXC math and English fees for all secondary students, secured low-cost ICT services for income thresholds for income households at $20 per month for about 5,000 households, provided bachelor's degree scholarships in keeping with the policy of one university graduate per household, allocated seven million to the home care program to secure care for the elderly, provided an additional 10 million to the Ministry of Equity to provide social assistance to the needy, subsidies on the price of fuel, flour, and rice, paid 18.3 million in back pay to public servants during the fiscal year, paid severance of 4.4 million to 47 em former employees of Liat 1974 Limited, paid long outstanding termination benefits to 196 former employees of Majestic Industries Limited, paid government pensioners a one-off payment of $500 each last year, effective 1st January 2023, all workers earning up to 25,000 annually pay no income tax 
Over 10,000 workers pay no tax on their income. A 4.2% increase for NIC pensioners. Paid $800,000 in flood relief to households affected by November 6 weather events. Launched the MSME loan grant facility of 10 million in grants and loans to micro, small, and medium businesses. Launched the youth economy. Providing training, marketing, finance, and mentorship to youth entrepreneurs. Provided 1 million to reinstate the distress fund. Mr. Speaker, as an open economy, we are affected by what takes place in the international community. Therefore, in preparation for this budget, we remain mindful of events and developments taking place in the wider environment. Mr. Speaker, despite the reopening of the larger economies, global economic growth was estimated to have fallen sharply from 6.2% in 2021 to 3.4% in 2022. This global economic decline has been occasioned by the war in Ukraine, the COVID-19 lockdowns in China, and more recently, the dramatic collapse of a few significantly sized banks. Mr. Speaker, the attendant consequences of some of these global events brought with it unpre unprecedented levels of inflation in 2022. Mr. Speaker, we also witnessed coordinated monetary policy tightening by major central banks in their fight to curtail rising inflation. The rise in interest rates over a short period has had the effect of eroding the balance sheets of many financial institutions and the threat of contagion within the international financial system. Mr. Speaker, growth in our major tourism source market, the USA, has slowed from 5.9% in 2021 to 2% in 2022. The rise in headline inflation prompted the Federal Reserve to increase interest rates seven times, bringing it to a high of 5% in March 2023, the highest level in 15 years. Notwithstanding these interest rate hikes, inflation in the US remains stubbornly high, averaging at 8.1% in 2022 and peaking at 9% in June of that same year. Mr. Speaker, the encouraging news, though, is that the growth in jobs in the U.S. in 2022 was 4.5 million, the second strongest on record. Mr. Speaker, in the case of Canada, an important tourist market, its economy proved resilient in 2022, registering a growth rate of 3.5 percent, though lower than that in 2021 of 5 percent. The United Kingdom's economy grew by 4.1% in 2022, a, a decline from 7.61% in 2021. However, the UK economy remains the only major advanced economy that has not fully recovered in its pre-pandemic level. Amid political uncertainty, fears of a recession, and runaway inflation, the British pound fell in value to its lowest level in decades in late September, approaching parity with the US dollar until a partial recovery in 2023. Mr. Speaker, I now move to the regional environment. The CARICOM region experienced a more vibrant pace of economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Estimates show that most CARICOM territories recorded positive economic growth rates in 2022, driven by strong performances in Guyana's emerging energy sector and the continued rebound in tourist arrivals in the tourism-dependent economies since the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions. Guyana, St. Lucia, and Barbados recorded the highest growth rates. And St. Lucia, and St. Lucia recorded the second highest growth rate after Guyana. Mr. Speaker, you have heard the rumor mongers and the prophets of doom that the economy is in a state of decay and facing economic ruin. 
the opposition predicted financial chaos with a government unable to pay its debts and public salaries. Mr. Speaker, of course, disappointingly for them, none of this has happened. Even, even in a difficult external environment of global inflation, war in Ukraine, COVID, and rising international political tensions. Notwithstanding a challenging external environment, I am pleased to report that the economy of St. Lucia is projecting real GDP growth of 18.1% in 2022. This is following a growth of 12.2% in 2021. Mr. Speaker, this 2022 performance was reflective of strong performances in all sectors of the tourism industry and growth in manufacturing and the agricultural sector of 11.4 and 9.8 respectively. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the development in the, in the accommodation sector and restaurant subsectors was the largest contributors to the 2022 real growth of 18%. The accommodation sector grew by 58.5% and contributed 18.2% to total GDP. Of the 18.2% growth recorded in 2022, 10.8% points were accommodation and food services. Tourism grew by 58%. Stay over arrivals 78.7% while cruise arrivals increased by 273.8%. These developments were due to the removal of all COVID protocols in, se in September 2022, growth in the number of cruise passengers, and strategic and targeted market initiatives in North America and the UK. The second largest contributor to growth was wholesale and retail activity. This sector grew by 23.7%, and contributed 10.6% of total real GDP growth. Growth in the sector represented 2.52% of the 18.2% growth. Telecommunication services were the third largest contributor to the 2022 GDP growth. This sector contributes 4.4% of total GDP and grew by 46% and represents 1.5%. 58% of the 18.2% growth that came from this sector. Manufacturing was the fourth largest economic sector. That sector grew by 11.4% in 2022, following a 4.2% growth in 2021. The 11.4% growth was the highest growth since 2007. This the sector's contribution to GDP was 3.4%. Agriculture was the fifth largest sector. The sector grew by 9.8% following declines in 2021 and 2020. Its share of GDP was 1.6%. Mr. Speaker, growth in the economy in 2022 brought lower unemployment with further reductions projected for 2023. The latest unemployment rate in December 2022 was 19%, with youth unemployment at 25.9%, both being the lowest since 2010. Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to driving overall unemployment and in particular youth unemployment down to single digits before the end of this parliamentary term. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the improvement in the performance of the economy has enhanced the government's fiscal position, which enabled continued provision of financial relief to individuals particularly within the vulnerable and low-income groups. 
to assist them in mitigating the impact of inflation. Mr. Speaker, our overall revenue performance also increased, driven by the expansion in domestic economic, economic activity and elevated imported prices. There were, there were moderate increases in current expenditure, but the overall deficit declined from 287.6 million, or 5% of GDP in 2021, to 17.3 million, or 1.5% of GDP in 2023. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, following three consecutive years of deficits, the primary balance returned to a surplus of 82.4% or 1.3% of GDP, while the current balance improved from a deficit of 139.1 million or 27% of GDP to a surplus of 12.6 million or 0.2% of GDP. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there was a deceleration in the total stock of public debt with the country's debt-to-GDP ratio down to 69.8% in 2022 from 85.9% in 2021. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the government, mindful that the upturn in economic activity may not have been felt by the vulnerable, increase the public assistance budget by 5 million to 25.9 million for the year 2023. This figure represents the highest, the highest allocation to those most in need. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, notwithstanding the increases in allocation for public assistance, the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, SSDF, distributed over $17 million in social intervention programs. <laughs> Downside risk. Mr. Speaker, while the domestic economy is showing positive signs of growth, there are some downside risks that we need to guard against. These include supply chain issues and increasing freight costs, prolonged and escalated war in Ukraine, monetary policy tightening by central banks and rising interest rates, natural disasters and volatility in crude oil prices. Mr. Speaker, it is necessary to inform the public of the true picture about fuel prices and the impact on the St. Lucian people. Mr. Speaker, I need not remind members that St. Lucia is not an oil-producing country and therefore has no influence over the price of imported petroleum products. It is for this reason the government is committed to exploring the use of renewable energy to reduce St. Lucia's reliance on imported petroleum products. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the increase in global demand for oil, triggered by the increase in global economic activity, as countries emerged from COVID-19 pandemic, drove the price of petroleum products upwards. In St. Lucia, during 2022, the average cost of the imported prices of gasoline, diesel, and liquefied propane gas was up on the previous year by 43.3%, 83.7%, and 65.3% respectively. The government has continued to apply the modified market price through mechanism in its pricing of petroleum products. Mr. Speaker, the government in 2022 foregone approximately $40 million by subsidizing LPG cooking gas on the modified pass-through mechanism. Mr. Speaker, despite our best efforts to cushion the rising price of the rising cost of petroleum products through lower excise taxes, the retail price of fuel ranged from 13.95 to 17.95 per gallon in 2022. Mr. Speaker, 
for those who choose to ignore the effects of the government in protecting the consumer at a time of rising imported fuel costs. Let me inform them that the excise tax in 2022 reached a low of minus 44 cents per gallon. And in the three weeks ending July 2022, it was minus a dollar per gallon. The lowest since the modified pass-through mechanism was adopted in 2029. Mr. Speaker, in 2009, Mr. Speaker, during 2022, the excise tax on diesel was negative for the greater part of the year. Mr. Speaker, these negative excise rates means the government was paying the importers of fuel, soil and rubies, 44 cents and $1 per gallon to ensure that the importers' legally stipulated margins were secured. Mr. Speaker, in the case of cooking gas, the protection provided by the government to customers was even more significant. The subsidy on the 20-pound cylinder rose from an average of 10.84 in 2021 to $19.43 per cylinder in 2022. In July 2022, the subsidy on cooking gas reached a high of $30.39 per cylinder. Mr. Speaker, this is the real picture of the government's assistance in shielding consumers from the high imported cost of fuel, which is contrary to the misinformation peddled by those, by those who have made misinformation their staple for communicating with the public. And Mr. Speaker, the words of Exodus comes to mind. You must not pass along false rumors. You must not cooperate with evil people by lying on the witness stand. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we noted and addressed the downside economic risks and challenges that confronted us. And in so doing, managed to maintain the economic stability and protected the livelihoods of our people. Mr. Speaker, I now move briefly to some of the sectors and will allow ministers to provide details during their presentations. Mr. Speaker, my government remains committed to the philosophy that education is the path to escaping poverty and experiencing a fulfilling life. This is why we encourage and promote lifelong learning and the joy of learning at an early stage. The Ministry of Education has embarked upon a transformational approach to improving our education system so that it is inclusive, responsive, accessible, and relevant to the needs of the society. This transformational approach has necessitated improvements to the physical infrastructure, use of ICT, special training for teachers, promotion and access to good nutrition on our school's feeding program, and the enhancement of our children's emotional intelligence. Mr. Speaker, reforms are taking place at all levels within our education system. Our goal, that every household should have a university graduate, has been supported by an increase in the availability of university scholarships sponsored by friendly countries, in particular Taiwan. Monroe College and the government's university package of assistance program, for which a sum of half a million dollars has been allocated in this budget. As it relates to reforms in the education system, special mention must be made of the growing concern about underachievement by our boys. To address this problem, a cohort of 40 te teachers will receive training in gender-sensitive instructions in the latter part of this year. This hopefully should result in a reduction in dropout rates among boys, particularly after COVID-19. 
The success of the TVET program continues to meet the needs of students who are more receptive to learning outside the traditional teaching methods, provide, providing them with practical learning and skills that are required in the workplace. TVET remain an integral part of our country's education system. Mr. Speaker, putting people first, this government subscribes to the policy of poverty reduction, a goal embedded in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our, our philosophical position is grounded in, sentiments, in the sentiments of the courts. Good economics begins with a general concern for people. Hence the reason, Mr. Speaker, why the government for the Ministry of Equity continues to develop strategies that seek to improve the quality of life for the most vulnerable. Thousands of St. Lucians continue to benefit, benefit from public assistance, child disability grants, education, housing assistance, home care support, and crime and violence reduction initiatives. Mr. Speaker, government has made available $25 million for the public assistance program, the largest ever contribution to the vulnerable in our society. <clears throat> While the government continues to deliver social assistance, we believe that we must try to empower people and build resilience towards sustainable, independent living. A graduation strategy for social assistance programs has been developed to ensure support for the people transitioning from social assistance or dependency to independent living. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in my main budget presentation last year, I explained this government's vision of an economic space for the youth of St. Lucia. I stated, that the youth economy was aimed at transforming hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into business by providing finance, training, mentorship, and marketing support for young people to establish and grow their businesses. Mr. Speaker, the youth economy has now been established as the Youth Economy Agency, the YEA, and has, and has opened its doors for business on 3rd April 2023. The government has to date injected four million to the youth economy for the provision of soft loans and grants to young persons with interest in sports, music, entertainment, designing, the creative economy, cultural activities, the digital economy, arts, agriculture, the blue economy, and agro-processing. Mr. Speaker, the agency, the agency will operate on the principles of accountability, flexibility, and agility to avoid, to avoid bureaucracy and asset-based collateral, which has often frustrated young persons in search of capital for business startups and expansion. The agency will attend to the special needs of rural and urban at-risk youth for their integration into the economy and to reduce the high incidence of youth unemployment. Mr. Speaker, this new business facilitation agency has generated widespread interest from development agencies and governments, both regionally and internationally. Since opening its doors in early April, the agency's website has received 7,000 visitors, over 800 followers on social media platforms, and over 150 walk-ins visitors to the Yee office. Mr. Speaker, in that short period, 192 applications for grants and 75 applications for loans have been registered in the agency. From the 192 grant applications, 11 grants have been issued, amounting to $55,000. 49 applications have been processed and approved for disbursements. 50 applications have been contacted to arrange reviews interviews and consultations, and new applications are being received daily.
from the 75 loan applications, 40 applications have been reviewed with an average loan request of $30,000. Mr. Speaker, the government is confident that the new agency will be true to its mandate and will facilitate numerous business opportunities and bring renewed hope to our young people as they pursue their dreams in the different areas of endeavor. Mr. Speaker, the tourism industry has been the main driver of our economic growth, and the management performance of the industry account to a large extent for our economic viability. Mr. Speaker, our first objective must be to build a sustainable and resilient tourism industry. In this regard, we will, during this year, enact a new tourism development bill which seeks to harmonize the legislative framework for the tourism industry. The bill has now been finalized and harmonizes the legislative framework for the tourism industry by repealing existing tourism incentive legislation, the Tourism Incentive Act, the Tourism Stimulus and Investment Act. This bill is the product, is the product of extensive benchmarking, both regionally and internationally, and several rounds of consultation with key government agencies, the private sector, and other stakeholders in the industry, and aims at establishing a single but comprehensive legal framework. This strategic policy direction is, expe is expected to create an environment <coughs> that will enable development, growth, and resiliency, and sustainability in the tourism industry. Our second objective is to ensure that the benefits of tourism accrue to as many as possible. We must create a framework for the growth of the industry that allows for more St. Lucians to participate and own the industry. The new Tourism Development Bill will provide significant incentives and concessions across all sectors and will no longer be limited. It means now that the sectors most St. Lucians are likely to own will receive the necessary support to flourish. We have reoriented the community tourism concept from a village notion with franchises to one of the community involvement with partnerships with St. Lucia and communities. The overall objective of the community tourism is to remove barriers to ensure local economic development through local inclusion and local investment and to develop sustainable community-based tourism activities that ensure that socio-cultural authenticity of host communities are respected. Mr. Speaker, when we assumed office, the community tourism program had no office or staff, no processes in place, and no community consultations. We have decided, and I'm again pleased to announce, that we are seeking an amount of US dollars, three million, from the CARICOM Development Fund to support the communities which were not included in the initial pilot communities. Communities in Miku, in Marsha, <laughs> Serenity Park, the Mine of Basilica and Castries, Denry, the Mon Lebai, Bellevue, and Piro, among others. Our third objective is to build a destination that provides not only a spectacular landscape but more meaningful and quality experiences. For that reason, three signature programs were launched in 2022. One, the collection, the petite, a collection of villas, hotels, and bed and breakfast, with rooms ranging from four to 45, providing unique experiences of food, culture, and entertainment. Two, the National Cabaway, Cabaway Crawl, a culture bar hopping experience for locals and visitors. And Lucian Links, a program designed to formally celebrate that, the diaspora and to further encourage them to enjoy the St. Lucian product. Mr. Speaker, this year, we'll continue to introduce new products that will enhance our standing as a destination. I'm pleased to announce that the St. Lucia Tourism Authority will launch this year the St. Lucia Visitor Loyalty Program, which is designed, 
which is designed to honor to honor regular repeat visitors this will build this will build greater loyalty to our destination and reward persons who are loyal to us mr speaker i am personally delighted to announce that the st lucia jazz and arts festival formerly st lucia jazz festival will start in a few days on may 5th at the renowned mindu philip park The festival has become one of the major events on St. Lucia's calendar of events and the most anticipated event on the Caribbean calendar. And it is now back. We are all eager in anticipation of a star-studded lineup. And over the years, the festival took on a new dimension with the addition of more side attractions, supporting jazz performances aside aside from the main, the main stage events. It is, an ex it is exciting that the arts component has been maintained. It is the ideal showcase for our creatives and for our local creatives and their chance to be on the world stage. Mr. Speaker, we witness continued growth in the Citizenship by Investment Program. The program recorded a 20% increase in 2021-2022 which was a record year. After a long and exhaustive review of the program, a number of changes were made to make the program more competitive and to yield greater returns. These include adjustments to the real estate, minimum investment, and adjustments to other fees, including dependent add-on and replacement of certificates. <coughs> this year, we'll see, we'll see further changes to the program, which is expected to deliver greater results. This will include a strengthened footprint in the growing markets in the, such as West Africa, the US, and the Middle East, through the hosting of conferences and other engagements. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia will always observe the accepted due diligence and accountability in its processes to ensure that the good reputation of our island is maintained. Mr. Speaker, culture and creativity plays a significant role in establishing our national identity, defining who we are and our purpose in this global civilization. We have prioritized the implementation of our cultural festivals and increased our, our allocations to various activities. Our cultural expressions have been energized and there is greater public interest and participation in these activities. Of note, Mr. Speaker, is the increased allocation given to the St. Lucia Tourism Authority to allow it to better market and promote our cultural activities. St. Lucia Tourism Authority has also been provided the resources needed to assist in promoting our creatives internationally and to merge destination marketing with our creatives. This year, Mr. Speaker, we will enact new legislation to facilitate the development of creative industries and to enable that sector to take its rightful place in national development. Mr. Speaker, the vexing issue of crime, particularly violent crime, is a major challenge that needs to be brought under control. Crime has become such a challenge that it triggered a two-day 17th to 18th April Regional Symposium of the Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community in part of Spain, Trinidad. <clears throat> the declaration following the symposium rightly recognized violent crime as multifaceted in nature and its pervasive effects requiring a robust regional response that includes a public health response, a societal response, including family, church, academia, cultural and sporting personalities, minority political parties, and the wider civil society. The call for involvement of minority political parties in this battle against crime is instructive. Mr. Speaker, of deep concern is the high rate of illegal exportation of firearms from the United States to the Caribbean. Mr. Speaker, crime and violence is becoming normalized in St. Lucia and the region and needs to be reversed. That is why, Mr. Speaker, 
Anyone who cares about their country should not find any comfort in criminal activity, unless, of course, they believe there is some gain to be derived or opportunity to score points from it. And if they do, they are no different from those directly involved in criminal activity. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in my show of commitment to this cause, I wish to inform you, members of this House, and the Solution Public, that I will lead this battle against crime without fear or favor. Or partisan thinking until the scourge of criminality is no more. And I invite my colleagues and civil society to join me in this battle to fight the scourge. Mr. Speaker, I was our strategic approach to reversing the rise and any normalization of violent crime will be focused on strengthening law enforcement and also making social interventions. Strengthening law enforcement. Mr. Speaker, at the legislative level, we have increased penalties for illegal possessions of firearms and ammunition. We have enacted the Suppression of Escalated Crime Police Powers Act, which gave the police the increased powers of search, arrest, and detention. We have enabled police the power to detain suspects for longer periods while investigations are taking place. We have created a, we have created a serious crime unit with plans for expansion. We have, created, we have employed an additional two probation officers we have we regularized the status of some police officers and bodily correctional officers. We've had 60 new recruits, ensuring they are properly vetted so that only people of the highest caliber can become members of our police force. We have provided training opportunities for police officers in tactical operations, investigations, human rights, and gender sensitivity, emotional intelligence, community policing, treatment of vulnerable persons, crime scene management, and anti-gang training. Improving the working conditions and welfare of members of the police force. We are working to improve police morale. We will review and upgrade the strategic plan for the police. Training of court prosecutors. Review promotion policy for police cor correctional customs and inner revenue staff. Employment of new bodily correctional recruits. The improvements in the physical facilities and conditions of work for policemen include construction of divisional headquarters in Grosely, that construction has begun. Repairs to sovereign divisional headquarters in Viewfort, contract was signed last week. Repairs to police stations in Canaries, Miku, Richford, and Marshall. Construction of custody suites a project plagued by administrative delays. I'm pleased, Mr. Speaker, to inform you that a contract for the construction will be signed this week. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we will be commissioning the new drug squad building shortly. Relocation of various units to more conducive working environments. Purchase of new vehicles, motorcycles, trucks, and bicycles. Purchase of special police equipment, including drones, X-ray machines, bulletproof vests, and ammunition. Upgrading of the forensic lab, and the purchase of a comparison microscope for firearms analysis, and repairs to the bodily correctional facility. Mr. Speaker. Last year, we began the process of reducing the backlog of cases in the court by introducing, by introducing the SWIFT Justice Project, which is expected to reduce the processing time for cases to no, to no more than two years. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, 
For many reasons, this project has not achieved the desired results. Mr. Speaker, this year, we have allocated $2 million for the project and already preparing the, the physical facilities to house the courts. It is envisioned that the project will be fully operational this year. Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the rights of the accused are protected and justice is served, we have increased the allocation for legal aid and court-appointed attorneys. We will begin the construction of the halls of justice to house the criminal, civil, and marriage court to eventually alleviate the congestion and poor working conditions presently experienced in some of our court buildings. Consideration will be given to the enactment of legislation for judge-only criminal trials. The completion of the process of the ascension to the Caribbean Court of Justice will make appeal to the highest court more affordable and accessible to all. <clears throat> Establishment of a first district traffic court to handle the significant backlog of note to hand of notices, warrants, and ticket-related offenses. Establishment of the coroner's court to handle matters relating to death deemed to be unnatural or in the exercise of law enforcement. The coroner will handle inquests and investigations currently before the courts. Expanding the witness protection program. We will seek to improve the quality of life for the most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, with regard to human resource development for the police, the engagement of the regional security system to assist our local police, increasing the training vote for the police to allow additional training in crime detection, surveillance, and other modern crime fighting techniques. Establishment of the sheriff's office to handle assets subject to risks. Increasing the broadband width at Bodily to allow for the hearing of more than one case virtually and repairs to the first and second district courts. Mr. Speaker, the criminal justice system must not be only about punishment. It must allow room for rehabilitation, particularly for young offenders who find themselves in the child justice system. In this regard, an allocation has been made for the commencement of preliminary works, public consultation, and designs for the conversion of the former George Charles Secondary School to a rehabilitation center. A crime and violence reduction project will be implemented to engage vulnerable and at-risk individuals in education and parenting. Strengthening of, com of community-based organization, establishing mentorship, training, capacity building, and diversion options. Working in the St. Lucia Social Development Fund to establish a crime prevention office to coordinate crime reduction prevention and intervention programs initiated by civil society groups, non-governmental organizations, and government agencies. The creation of a targeted gang intervention plan. Mr. Speaker, the fight against crime must be a national effort, with government and civil society groups working together. In this regard, the government will be providing current and future non-state actors and non-governmental agencies involved in crime supp suppression, at, in crime suppression activities, with financial assistance. The government remains encouraged by the, by the societal response that has been shown for the social health of the nation by these groups. The crime challenge calls for a bold and different approach. In addition to the law enforcement approach, which is very often reactionary, my government will seek to confront some of the social issues that contribute to crime. Unemployment, poor housing, inadequate educational facilities, early school dropouts, 
absence of activities that engender a sense of community and opportunities for conflict resolution. These factors, though not, though not exhaustive, provide some insight into the issues that need to be addressed in trying to solve the crime problem. My government will undertake a series of heavy social interventions in areas particularly burdened with crime and will be drawing on the resources and cooperation of community groups, civil society groups, counselors, social workers, and local businesses. My government will commit to putting the necessary financial resources to support this initiative. The unprecedented search unprecedented surge, surge in crime and violence in Vivot has necessitated special intervention by the government in consultation with the parliamentary representative, neighboring parliamentary representatives, and concerned civil society groups. Elements of the special intervention will include, one, identification of available land for resettlement. Two, dialogue with the owners of land in the town of Vivot to empower ownership and to assist home ownership. Psychosocial support for residents to deal with trauma will urge to urge social recovery and enhance the economic well-being. In this regard, the government will work closely with the NGO community. The establishment of information desks by specialized ministries to provide help and guidance to citizens to access government services. For example, the Ministry of Commerce will establish a presence to assist citizens to access to small business loans. Special economic, educational, and sports programs for at-risk groups. Construction of, of an administrative complex and a cultural center for the people of Viewfort and the South within this tomb. This will fulfill a promise made to the people of Viewfort during the 2021 election campaign. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Viewfort initiative is being designed to foster a sense of security, support, and shared outcomes to foster pride and ownership that can help to build a stronger sense of community. Mr. Speaker, social assistance is a crucial component of, our, of any society, as it provides a safety net for some of the most vulnerable. For the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, my government has provided targeted intervention to help reduce poverty and inequality. Several initiatives have positively impacted the lives of hundreds of individuals through projects such as, but not limited to, Our Boys Matter, Single Mothers Micro Enterprise Project, Social Stability Initiative, and the Basic Needs Trust Fund. Mr. Speaker, during the year, SSDF engaged in the following activities. Christmas stimulus, 3.2 million. Easter stimulus, 3.2 million. Educational assistance, 2 million. <laughs> Hope, <laughs> Hope, 1 million. Short term employment, 6 million. Pre hurricane cleanup, 1.5 million. A total of approximately 17 million. It's expected, Mr. Speaker, that these activities will intensify this year. Mr. Speaker, social assistance is a crucial component of any society. These programs play a critical role in building stronger, more resilient communities and ensuring that all members of society can live with dignity and respect. Mr. Speaker, the issue of health care will remain a dominant topic on the developmental agenda of all countries, small and large. St. Lucia has had the constant battle of having to divert more of its scarce resource, 
scarce financial resources to the health of the nation, while its health workers, particularly nurses, continue to seek better opportunities in more developed countries like the UK and the USA. Mr. Speaker, our health services continue to be challenged in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. Notwithstanding the challenges, St. Lucia has experienced gains in key health indicators, higher rates of immunization coverage, improvements in the nutritional status of children, expansion of health and social services, increased life expectancy, and improvement to the physical infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health will provide further details about the challenges and gains in the health sector. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Health has laid out its focal areas for this year. One, establishment of a cancer registry. Two, establishment of an elderly affairs unit. Three, refurbishment of the Larry Schultz Health Center. Four, refurbishment of, of the Sufra Health Center while advancing plans for the construction of the Sufra Hospital. Five, repairs and expansion of the Comfort Bay Home. Six, expansion of clinical services at the primary health centers. Seven, enactment of the food safety bill. Eight, establishment of a program for in retention of health workers, particularly nurses. And nine, launching of the Golden 80 Plus medical package. Mr. Speaker, the government has pledged to pursue a health policy where health care is affordable, accessible, and equitable. The Universal Health Care Program is expected to, to deliver this policy effectively and efficiently. In my budget address last year, I promised that we would commence the process for the implementation of UHC. I can inform this House that this process has commenced and the following has been achieved. One. A public servant public education program has begun. It is expected that the necessary legislation and an extensive communication plan and enabling legislation will be the output of that process. Two, a maternal and child and child health care program will be the first stage of services provided. Three, the launch of the performance-based financing program. Four, the registration of the population into the health information system to issue, so the issue of a health card to every citizen. There are significant aspects of the UHC which are already happening and are being implemented, and these include free medicines for diabetics and hypertension patients. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Health and the Millennium Heights Medical Complex, the MHMC, will develop the Castries Multipurpose Health Facility to include the Castries Urban Polyclinic and the Secondary Care Wing of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex. The CUPC will be an urgent care support unit, relieving pressure on the non-emergency cases at the Accident and Emergency Department of the OKEU. The secondary care wing will accommodate patients freeing up, so that freeing up bed space at the OKEU. The Millennium Heights Medical Complex will implement a capital program to include the installation of a backup generator, mold remi remediation, upgrading of some of the wards, improvement of the waste treatment plant, and improvements to the hot and cold water systems. A loan of 23 million has been guaranteed by the government of St. Lucia for the capital works and working capital. And also a loan and the payment to Cayman City of $11.5 million. The Millennium Heights Medical Complex embarked on several initiatives to enhance the delivery of patient care services during the year 2022 to 2023. They include an oxygen plant, improvements in the main entrance and reception areas of the hospital, and provision of a private entrance for admissions, billings, and appointments. In 2022 2023, 
the reconstruction of the east and west canopies of the St. Jude Hospital, the improvements to the laboratory areas and improvements to the reception area were completed. Major equipment, including ventilators, laboratory equip equipment, and an anesthetic machine were installed at the institution. The government has increased the subvention to St. Jude and finalized discussions with the National Insurance Corporation to increase its contributions to the facility. And the workers of St. Jude will be paid their back pay income tax free. Mr. Speaker, my government has placed health high on its agenda with a significant allocation being made to it. We intend to spend in this financial year over $200 million on health care. This excludes the expenditure on the refurbishment of St. Jude Hospital and the outstanding debt on the box, estimated to be over $50 million. Mr. Speaker, this year, the PROUD program will continue to advance the process of land rationalization in the communities of Oleho, Pominoje, Cantonment, and Bruceville and Viewfort. This program aims at empowering the occupants of government owned lands in, un in unplanned developments by giving them access to fully serviced landlords at affordable prices. In most of these cases, the cadastral surveys are, surveys are well advanced and we expect to transfer title to the occupants within the coming year. Mr. Speaker, this year, the enactment of legislation to convert Proud into a statutory corporation in which the land will be invested. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia's housing stock deficit has been worsening by the rising cost of building materials and available and affordable housing lots. My government in this budget will attempt to address the rising cost of building construction. Later in my presentation, I will see how. The National Insurance Corporation for NIPRO will be undertaking a major social housing program in the Maskey area during this financial year. Plans for the program are currently before the Development Control Authority. This should make available over 100 low-cost lots and houses. The National Housing Corporation has also been in discussion with a major develop, developer to provide a similar quantum of low-cost housing. The government, in its resettlement and rationalization program, will assist households occupying government-owned lands to secure land title. During this parliament, government will pursue an aggressive campaign to reduce the country's housing de deficits. The Department of Housing will continue the National Housing Assistance Program, which seeks to provide housing assistance to low-income and indigent groups who require satisfying their basic housing needs. 280 households have benefited from this program. This program is being financed by the government of Taiwan. The National Sites and Service Program, NSSP, involves the development of state-owned lands and the provision of service residential lots at locations throughout the island. Crown lands at Lafag, Pi, Pi, and Labri have been identified for development. The minister will give further details. Mr. Speaker, medium and MSMEs remain important sectors in the economic landscape of St. Lucia, providing the greatest opportunity for the spread of wealth and the creation of employment. Access to finance remains a perennial challenge for this group. The new challenge 
is the need for these enterprises to embrace modern technologies to remain nimble, efficient, and competitive. In this fiscal year, the government is making available the sum of $10 million for the SLDB, St. Lucia Development Bank, for the medium and small and micro enterprises loan grant fund. Disbursements have commenced, and yesterday, disbursements commenced yesterday, and grants and loan payments will be made in a ratio of 70% grant and 40% loan. As it relates to embracing new technologies, an allocation has been made in this budget as the government's contribution to the MSME project funded by the OAS and the government of St. Lucia to allow MSMEs to enter the digital economy. This project is expected to significantly increase MSME's capacity to market and sell the products and services online. Export St. Lucia continues to provide technical assistance to MSMEs producing goods and services with export market potential. The strengthening of MSMEs will be a strategic choice if the benefits of the cannabis industry is to be widespread. A task force has been established to assist in the development of a cannabis framework and a bill should be in Parliament shortly. Again, the Minister will give further details. Constitutional reform. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia became the fifth country in the region to make the Caribbean Court of Justice its final court of appeal. <laughs> By replacing His Majesty's Privy Council, many St. Lucians will have the opportunity to access justice at the highest court, a process that was restrictive and expensive to the ordinary man. The ascension to the Caribbean Court of, Just of Justice signals our desire to strengthen our participation in Caribbean regional integration and identify as a country that is autonomous, autonomous and resolute in determining our country's future. This journey is not complete. Our constitution has served us well, but we need, it needs to be further amended to reflect the hopes and aspirations of our people and respond to the need for the acceptance and celebration of our Caribbean identity. We will therefore continue to engage our citizens in conversations on the advance work to undertake constitutional reform in this country. The need to make our constitution truly reflective of the ideas and aspirations of, of our people will be continued this year. Never again will this House be without a Deputy Speaker. Letters have been sent to potential members to serve on a committee to review Parliament's consideration, to review for Parliament's consideration of the recommendations of the Constitutional Reform Commission reports. Mr. Speaker, last year, we launched the Youth Economy Agency and the Skilled St. Lucia web browser, or SEM58 Skilled app. This year, the Youth Resilience, Inclusive and Empowerment focuses on security and violence reduction and prevention among youth in the community. Mr. Speaker, football is the most popular sport in St. Lucia. And given its popularity, a properly organized semi-professional football league will create meaningful economic activity and sustainable livelihoods. We intend to commence a semi-professional football league this year.
to employ young football players. This league will ensure that players who have the necessary skills and make the necessary sacrifices can be adequately compensated and also have hope of being recruited by international football scouts. The minister, the minister will elaborate further on this new initiative. Julian Alfred. Julian Alfred has been St. Lucia's leading athlete for the past five years. In July 2017, she won St. Lucia's first gold medal at the Commonwealth Youth Games in the Bahamas by winning the girls on the 1800 meters dash. In 2022, she was crowned the NCAA Division I champion and later that year won the silver medal in the Commonwealth Games Women's 100 meter finals. The country has been witnessing the feats and the breaking of records by Gillian Alfred. Therefore, we believe that it is imperative that she graduates from Texas University in June this year. We will provide her with the necessary resources to continue her path of high performance. The ministry has budgeted finances to ensure that she continues to receive the very best training to perfect her craft and hopefully represent our country at the 2024 Olympics. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in recognition of our outstanding achievements, the government has provided Ms. Alfred with a diplomatic passport to facilitate her travel. The ministry has been undertaking renovations at the Mindu Phillip Park, still a major rec recreational ground for athletes and cricketers. These renovations will continue after the opening of the Jazz Festival on May 5, 2023. After the opening, se several other playing facilities will be refurbished, lighted, and renovated this year. The St. Lucia Development Bank. Last year, we indicated that the St. Lucia Development Bank, the SLDB, would be required to play a more significant role in facilitating development and low-cost funding to small and medium-sized enterprises. Mr. Speaker, I indicated then that to finance its mandate, the bank needed to be recapitalized. The government has kept its promise and already injected $4.6 million into the capital of the bank. A further injection is promised this year. Mr. Speaker, I can announce that the Solution Development Bank, supported by a government guarantee, has fully disbursed 5 million euros allocated to working capital and COVID-19 support for MSMEs. The St. Lucia Development Bank, working in the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of Finance, is a partner in the disbursement of the CDB-funded MSME of $10 million to that sector. Mr. Speaker, the SLDB will continue its modernization and expansion of its operations while diversifying its portfolio to serve the housing and developmental needs of the people. Mr. Speaker, as the world grapples with the issues of food security and climate change, the agricultural sector will continue to play a vital role in the economy providing rural employment, food and nutrition security, and poverty reduction. Agriculture has, been, be, has become more important over the past few years, with escalating food prices arising from supply chain disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing Ukraine war. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the agriculture sector has expanded this year. The, 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 pandemic, the pandemic has awakened most countries to the need to place greater importance on food security. In that regard, member states of the Caribbean community have agreed to develop a regional food plan 
to achieve a 25% reduction in the region's food import bill by 2025. This year, we'll continue to aim at import reduction by placing focus on the expansion of livestock, fisheries, and the targeted seven crop program. Mr. Speaker, the banana industry continues to provide income security to several farmers in St. Lucia. This government has provided much technical support to strengthen the industry and has facilitated a loan for the NFTO through the St. Lucia Development Bank. We'll continue to support recovering the banana industry for the, establish the establishment of the banana management units mandated to enhance the overall performance of the banana industry by improving productivity and quality and securing market access. Mr. Speaker, cocoa has long been identified as an export crop with a value-added potential to generate much revenue in the, in the agriculture sector. We'll continue to provide the required support to expand cocoa production and to maximize the returns in the cocoa sector through increased focus on the processing of cocoa products in a suitably structured business model environment. Mr. Speaker, cassava and coconuts are two versatile crops with the potential for a variety of value-added products which can enhance our food and nutrition security, reduce St. Lucia's dependence on imported foods, and enable healthy lifestyles. During this year, we will provide the necessary report to farmers and agro-processors for the provision of planting material for expanding acreages on the coconut and cassava production and equipment for processors to increase the related value-added products. Honey production. Mr. Speaker, to expand export prospects for the production of local honey, we will focus on, a strengthening, be on strengthening beekeeping organizations to enable their viability and sustainability. We will continue to provide technical and marketing support, capacity building, resource and financial management, farm and product certification, branding and labeling of honey products. CMOS. Mr. Speaker, over the last three years, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of individuals engaged in the planting of CMOS in our coastal communities. CMOS farming has demonstrated the potential to create employment and contribute significantly to the social and economic well-being of our communities. During this year, we will provide resources to the CMOS industry for the enhancement of post-harvest quality control, production efficiency, farming area management, farmer training and capacity building, and access to markets so the industry can reach its true potential. Mr. Speaker, during this budget cycle, we'll establish an island-wide aquaponic system in schools and commercially viable system for farmers with disabilities. This will build capacity in soilless food production systems, improve the productivity of vegetable crops, and improve water management in agricultural systems. We believe that this low-cost system of production which requires little land, can enable significant production of some vegetables and fish farming. It is hoped that the use of technology may attract young entrants to the agricultural sector. Mr. Speaker, the fishing industry continues to play a significant role in our strategy for food and nutrition security. In this year's budget, we'll undertake improvements, repairs, and maintenance to the castries, Denry and Viewfort fishing facilities. These renovations will include fishing storage facilities and facilities to enable improved health and safety standards for the handling of fish and fish products. In this financial year, access to the Shozel fishing port will be improved by reducing the current sedimentation which hinders the productivity of fisher folk in the community. Mr. Speaker, this project has already secured funding from the Jamaic Japanese International Cooperation Agency, JICA. Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said since the signing of the MOU for the proposed spot development 
being negotiated between the government of St. Lucia and global port holdings. I can inform this honorable house that no agreement has been signed by this government contrary to the malicious comments and misinformation being made in some areas. And Mr. Speaker, I again, I again go to the big book for quotation. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. <coughs> An agreement will be signed once all the terms, once all the terms and conditions have met the government of St. Lucia's long-term objectives for port development. I am pleased to announce that we are close to doing so. This investment agreement will transform the Castries Harbor and the Soufre waterfront. <laughs> the improvements to Port Castries will include upgrades to Point Seraphine to allow for the largest cruise ships, a broadwalk from San Susi Bridge to the Vendors Arcade, a rebuilding and expansion of the Vendors Arcade, the creation of a parking hub to help alleviate the traffic problems around the city, and the establishment of a fisherman's village in Banan. Yeah. The Soufre waterfront will be completely redeveloped to offer an enhanced experience for yachts for visitors and for locals. I can assure St. Lucians that there is no agreement to exclude cruise port development in Viewfort. Mwevle di Jean St. Lucie, gouvernement poko si ye an ye pou di yo pakay ni cruise en Viewfort. And again, Mr. Speaker, I move, I want to quote the good book, Proverbs 12, 19. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Mr. Speaker, in fact, we are currently discussing various options for the development of cruise tourism in Beaufort. Mr. Speaker, for the fiscal year 2023-2024, whilst planning for major road projects such as the Shock to Grosley Highway expansion and the Field and Agricultural Roads Rehabilitation Project Phase 2, we will continue upgrading the road network and continue the maintenance of public assets. Mr. Speaker, while we are not satisfied with progress on the Millennium Highway, work will continue on the West Coast Road Reconstruction Project. A contract via competitive international bidding has been signed for the Ansari Bridge and work will commence during this quarter and for the continuation of the West Coast Road. And a consultant has been co contracted to develop the infrastructure 2030 plan. Mr. Speaker, the annoying traffic situation and loss of productivity and traffic congestion on the Grosley Highway and related loss of productivity is a direct result of the ill advanced actions of the last government. Mr. Speaker, I will, I will say that again. The annoying traffic situation and loss of productivity and traffic congestion on the Grosley Highway and related loss of productivity is a direct result of the ill-advanced actions of the last government. When on March 24, 2015, they canceled a loan from the Kuwaiti Fund to reconstruct the road. Mr. Speaker, I said last year 
We have commenced discussions with the Kuwait Fund, and these discussions are at an advanced stage. The Ministry of Infrastructure is presently providing the required updates and documentation to move to the approval process. Mr. Speaker, the government has reapproached the QAT Fund for the Feed and Agricultural Roads Project, approved again in 2015, but cancelled by the previous government. Mr. Speaker, discussions are progressing smoothly, and the responses are favorable, and a commencement date is expected later this year. Mr. Speaker, Access to justice is critical to the well-being of any modern democratic society. For some time now, the government has embarked on a process of consultation with the appropriate authorities for the construction of a house of justice so the judiciary can operate in an environment conducive to the dispensation of justice. <clears throat> I am pleased to report that plans are being finalized for the construction of that facility which is expected to start in the second half of this year. After discussions with the police, the new location has been changed <coughs> to the site of the decommissioned High Court building at the corner of Miku and Library Streets, and the building will be joined to the old Ministry of Education building. Mr. Speaker, the project will be built for a build, operate, lease, and transfer a bolt arrangement. An allocation of 1.5 million has been included in this year's estimates for pre-construction activities. The new police northern division headquarters. Mr. Speaker, the police also need to operate in an environment that is conducive to high performance. The northern division of the police force has been waiting for such a facility for too long. I am, I am pleased to report that earlier this month, work commenced on the construction of the new Grozile Police Station and Northern Divisional Headquarters under a bill operate lease transfer both arrangement with NIPRO for $35 million, inclusive of furniture, fixtures, and fittings. New Sufre Hospital. Mr. Speaker, as part of improving the health service infrastructure throughout the country, we will commence pre-construction activity for the Sufre Hospital. This level four health facility will allow for overnight observation and short stays for non-critical cases. Mr. Speaker, in addition to serving the residents of Sufre and its environs, this facility will supplement our tourism project product, given the essential role of Sufra in the tourism sector. We, are, we have allocated $2 million in this budget for pre-construction activity for this project. The facility is expected to be constructed through a design finance construct arrangement with the pro proposed location on Sir Afalus Street in Sufra Town. New Police Central Headquarters. Mr. Speaker, Consistent with the commitment of this government to provide the proper working environment for the police force, a new police headquarters will be constructed to house the key divisions of police operations in the city of Castries. To this end, an allocation of $300,000 is included in this budget for pre-construction financing for this project. Construction is expected to start in the latter part of this fiscal year. Mr. Speaker, the View 4 Division Headquarters has been closed for repairs for a few years now. The initial cost of repairs was $300,000 for roof repairs and mold infestation treatment. But it was neglected, and now the cost has now escalated to $2.3 million. On April 24, 2023, NIPRO issued a contract to a construction firm to undertake the necessary repairs. Works are expected to be completed in four months. Custody Suites. 
Mr. Speaker, a design finance contract, DFC, for 4.2 million has been awarded for the conversion of the old part of the old police headquarters building for this holding facility. St. Jude Hospital reconstruction. Mr. Speaker, in my budget statement last year, I gave an account of what transpired in the process of reconstructing St. Jude Hospital on the site at OJ Viewfort. Unfortunately, for unjustified political reasons, after being delayed for three years, the UWP administration wasted $110 million on a box, which left the people with no hospital after over $200 million had been spent since 2010. And I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, you'll be hearing more about that later. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that from 1st November 2022, work commenced on the original buildings to deliver the St. Jude Hospital to the people of the South in the shortest possible time. The project is being managed by the Project Management Unit, PMU, within the Department of Economic Development in conjunction with the Department of Infrastructure. Additionally, the Cabinet of Ministers has appointed a National Hospital Reconstruction Steering Committee, a steering committee to guide and oversee the the construction of the St. Jude Hospital transfer facility. The initial contracted works for the cleaning, sanitization, and fencing of the hospital are close to completion. Refurbishment works have started on the structures following the granting of approval from the Development Control Authority for some of these structures. Mr. Speaker, a design supervision engineering firm has been contracted to assist the PMU team in the process of design review and scoping and to arrive at final costings and contractual arrangements for early completion of the hospital. Mr. Speaker, $32.75 million has, has been allocated in this year's budget to meet outstanding payments for work done done on the existing structure, the box. $32.75 million has been allocated for work for debt on the box. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that since coming into office, this government's policy of transparency and fairness in dealing with investors has been well received by existing and potential investors in our country. Mr. Speaker, we have had to re-engage several investors to re-establish their interest and confidence in St. Lucia for a demonstration of commitment and responsible government. We have witnessed one of the highest levels of investment in recent times, and this year promises to be another significant year for foreign and local investment. I wish to highlight some of our major achievements and planned investments for the ensuing year. Mr. Speaker, we welcome the expansion of ITEL CX, formerly ITEL BPO, to St. Lucia into a newly renovated factory cell, factory shell. The construction upgrade of this facility, of this third facility, was completed in February 2022. Invest in Lucia Limited has been working on a fourth building for this tenant, which will allow for further expansion and employment this year. We also witness <laughs> we also witness the continued expansion of BPO KPO sector as KM2 expanded the operations in Massad, and a 188 Guansa is currently expanding into 12,000 square feet of new space in the north of the island. A St. Lucian owned Ascension International, a new entry in the BPO KPO space, is in the final stages of, rev of renovations of the facility in Sufre, 
it's expected that hundreds of jobs will be created from these new investments. Tourism investments. Mr. Speaker, the construction of the Grand Hyatt in Sabisha in Shozel will continue this fiscal year. The development boasts a 345-room hotel, Dream Resort Spa, and Zorji Wellness and Spa Resorts. Under this, initi this initiative, two luxury all-inclusive hotels are currently under construction and will be branded Dreams Resort Spa and Zorji Wellness and Spa Resorts, with 250 and 80 rooms, respectively. Courtyard Marriott at Point Seraphine. The construction of a nine-story business hotel at Point Seraphine will continue during this upcoming year. The facility of 140 rooms is expected to be opened next year. Kazaba Beach Resort, Lucian by Bespoke Hotel. A 90-unit hotel is expected to be completed during next year. Sandals Halcyon. Work is near completion on the expansion of Sandal Halcyon Hotel, which is expected to come into service this year. And Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I want to pay tribute to Sanders Chain and the late chairman, Mr. Butch Stewart. Um, it was 30 years this week that Sanders were operating in St. Lucia. I want to thank Sanders for the continued confidence they have shown in St. Lucia and the fact that expansion is taking place as we speak and work will start on the Sanders Hotel in the immediate future. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, for the period January to December 2022, Cabinet approved 35 projects for tourism incentives pursuant to the Tourism Incentives Act and the Tourism Stimulus and Investment Act. The total projected investment for the period amounted to $384 million. Mr. Speaker, the accommodation sector continued to attract the, the highest level of investment, amounting to EC $341.6 million, or approximately 89% of total investment. When these accommodation projects are completed, 262 new rooms will be added to St. Lucia's room stock. Iwanora International Airport Redevelopment Project. Mr. Speaker, after extensive research, analysis, and consultation, with local and foreign consultants and SLASPA, Cabinet has arrived at a policy decision for the preferred technical design development option for the development of the passenger terminal building under the Iwanora International Airport Redevelopment Project. A scaled down version of the existing design to obtain a single structure by removing components, including the elevated roadway is essentially a terminal building, building with a reduced modified footprint built on the already constructed foundation with the defer, deferral or elimination of certain program requirements is cabinet's decision. This option, Mr. Speaker, will address the issue of creating fiscal space by curtailing the construction design to make the project feasible within the available financing and from all the design options explored, this option appears to be the most prudent. Mr. Speaker, it's a fact that the true cost of the Honorary Redevelopment Project will only be determined after competitive bidding process for the construction of airport is undertaken since the present construction was awarded by direct award, and up to this day, up to this day, there is no bill of quantities for the award that was given to build the airports. Mr. Speaker, the chosen option, because of the size reduction, lends itself to cost reductions. The foundations are substantially completed by the contractor, and work has commenced for the construction of the air traffic control tower, which is in progress. And Mr. Speaker, you'll be hearing more about the UNO Airport Redevelopment Project at a later date. 
Mr. Speaker, let me reassure the public that, that my government expects the engagement between the contracted parties, which has been sought by controversies and disputes in the past, and which brought the project to stop. Note, Mr. Speaker, that the project has already experienced cost overruns in excess of $40 million and counting. Let me assure the public that his government's intention to continue the Hiwanora International Redevelopment Project in a fiscally responsible and prudent manner that will not cause undue burden to the taxpayers of St. Lucia. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I now move to the issue of blue bonds. Blue bonds. Debt sustainability and financing has become a significant issue. Developing countries are pursuing a path of leveraging the natural assets as a means of funding their development. Mr. Speaker, as you are aware, we are embarking on the issuance of a blue bond where the proceeds will be used to support projects which are aimed at achieving United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number six, clean water and sanitation, and sustainable goal number 14, life below water. St. Lucia intends to take this opportunity to make its mark on the international capital markets and to signal our environmental, social, and governance ambitions to the world. I am told our proposed bond issuance will be the world's first sovereign sustainability-linked blue bond. It will be the first blue bond to align with the United Nations Global Compact Blue Bond Guidance, United Nations Environment Program Finance Sustainability, Blue, Blue Economy Finance Principles, International Finance Corporation Guidance for Blue Finance, International Capital Market Association Principles, and the United Nations Global Compact Five Tipping Points for a Healthy and Productive Ocean. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia is receiving strong technical support from the UN Global Compact and the Global Green Growth Institute, among others, to ensure the success of our issuance. Mr. Speaker, the issuance of a blue bond would ensure the security of our citizens and our marine environment, given the immediate threat our nation faces from climate change. We will use these blue bonds to focus on two areas, reducing the volume of untreated water that enters our marine environment, and two, enhancing the sustainability aspects of the fisheries sector while also encouraging job creation. Fisheries are also a critical industry in St. Lucia. It is important that we move from subsistence for fishing and move up the value chain to deliver benefits both to the environment and to our citizens. A blue bond will enable St. Lucia to achieve these two outcomes. It will place us in a good position to build our reputation in the, in the international capital markets and work with people who are interested in ensuring St. Lucia's success from both a climate and economic perspective. A blue bond is critical to help us achieve the strong policy initiatives we have outlined in our nationally determined contribution, in our national adaptation plan, and our national ocean policy. Following the blue, blue bond issuance, it's expected that St. Lucia will then be able to attract much needed capital from the private sector. These investors will not just look at St. Lucia from a returns perspective, but they will look at us for impact-oriented outcomes to protect our environment. The Ministry of Finance is already working closely with the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Education, and the Water and Sewage Authority, WASCO, to ensure that we are all aligned to deliver a blue bond for St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, we are confident that our blue bond is issuance will serve as a template for our neighbors and fellow small island big ocean states and as an, exam, an, ex, as an exemplar standard in climate mitigation and adaptation. Mr. Speaker, 
the exploitation and sustainability of our ocean space as a resource provides an opportunity for growing the economy, but in ways that allow future generations to have similar or even better opportunities to benefit from it. We are therefore mindful of the need to harmonize where possible and regulate the activities of different sectors and agents who are engaged in the use of this resource economically or otherwise. There must be a collaboration between the fishing sector and tourism sector, each being aware of how the excesses are likely to affect the viability of the other's use and enjoyment of that resource. For example, overfishing and its negative impact on the, on the, on the, on the water ecosystem undermine the beauty and diversity of sea life and the unique attraction of our seabed. And those who use our surrounding coastline waters for pleasure must also be aware of the damage being done to sea life and livelihood of our fisher folk by polluting the water with harmful waste materials. The point being made, Mr. Speaker, is that there is a need for an awareness of our interdependence as it relates to the use of our coastal waters and ocean space as a first step in the development of a blue economy. Mr. Speaker, the awareness of interdependence in the country is also needed among states sharing the same waters, and so my government intends to adopt a collaborative approach with nearby states in the development of the blue economy. Mr. Speaker, our island is prone to natural disasters and climate change risks. These weather events can in hours reverse all our gains of growth in our country, Mr. Speaker. From 2007, we have undertaken to ensure with the Caribbean Catastrophic Risk, Risk Insurance Facility, CCRIF. With the increase in the severity of natural disasters, my government thinks it prudent to increase and extend our level of insurance coverage. Mr. Speaker, the World Bank has offered us the possibility to leverage a small portion of our idea resources under a program so as to, Mr. Speaker, the World Bank has offered us the possibility to utilize our leverage, to utilize and leverage a small portion of our idea resources. This option makes available US dollars 20 million to a country at short notice to respond to these disasters. Mr. Speaker, these are called cat bonds. Other Caribbean islands have benefited from this insurance coverage, and St. Lucia will express its interest to the World Bank in, in issuing a cat bond to assist our recovery if a disaster strikes. Sovereign Wealth Fund. It has been the objective of this government to create a multi-generational plan which would safeguard the future for next generations. To this end, we are in the process of exploring the pathways to set up a sovereign wealth fund. The fund, once set up, would be characterized by a strong and transparent governance structure, accountability, and robust risk management practices. Mr. Speaker, I will now outline the measures my government intends to maintain the gains we have made and to stimulate further growth of the St. Lucian economy. The Blue Economy, you bet project. The Contingent Emergency Response Component, CERC, under UBEC has been triggered with the primary objective of supporting the capacity of countries like St. Lucia to rapidly respond in the event of further eligible crisis or emergency. Mr. Speaker, under the CERC, three key areas of focus have been brought to the fore to obtain strides in food security. These focus areas include fisheries, livestock, and crop production, and will aim to achieve the following objectives. In fisheries, increase production, safety at sea, and enhance, and enhance food safety, sanitation, and hygiene. Livestock, enhance livestock production, crop production, improve agricultural infrastructure, irrigation, drainage, communal agriculture reservoirs, protected by agricultural te 
technology, land preparation services, increased availability of planting materials and farm supplies to enhance productivity and training and capacity building for farmers. Mr. Speaker, these activities in total will cost approximately $10 million over the life of the project. On the UBEC project, government is hopeful that this investment will positively impact many participants in these three sectors. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will now outline the measures my government intends to, in to undertake to maintain the gains we have made and to stimulate further growth of the St. Lucian economy. Starting from July 1st, 2023, we shall impose a health and security levy of 2.5% on goods and services, except on food items, medicines, selected building materials, medical equipment, and security equipment. The levy will be implemented to have a minimal inf inflationary impact and avoid any additional administrative burden and cost to businesses. Mr. Speaker, let me be, be very clear. This levy will not be imposed on any food items. Let me be clear. This levy will not be imposed on any food items. Nupaka mete pies levy asu manger. This levy will not be imposed on any food items. This means, Mr. Speaker, that the cost of food should not change because of the levy unless prices increase from overseas. I am urging the private sector to work with the government to ensure that this measure is not used as a basis for increasing the price of food. We expect, Mr. Speaker, that as freight charges come down, food prices and other imported items prices will also decrease. Mr. Speaker, to stimulate activity in the housing and constructing sector, I propose to remove VAT of 12.5% on the following building materials for a period of two years. Plywood, lumber, steel, steel cement, and galvanized. This means, Mr. Speaker, that the retail price of these items should be reduced by 12.5% unless the imported price of these changes increase. To ensure compliance, government will engage in a price monitoring exercise. The excise tax on tobacco products will be increased effective May 1st, 2023 by 50%. This new health and security levy is also intended to allow every citizen to contribute to the pressing needs of the health and security of our nation. We anticipate that this levy will raise $33 million per annum to support the much needed requirements for these two important sectors. Tax amnesty. Last year, Mr. Speaker, we initiated a tax amnesty program, offering taxpayers to settle their tax arrears free from penalties, fines, interest, if these taxes were paid by May 1st, 2023. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that many taxpayers accepted the government's offer to settle their tax arrears. However, Mr. Speaker, we understand that some businesses are still recovering from the COVID pandemic and will need to reinvent and retool. I am therefore proposing 
the extension of the tax amnesty program under the same conditions for businesses and individuals for another year ending May 1st, 2024. Tax refunds. Last year, we committed to setting tax refunds. A total of 3,703 taxpayers will pay a total of $8.9 million in refunds. From these payments, 2,146 taxpayers receive refunds of less than $2,000 of $2,000 and 1,557 taxpayers received over $2,000. This year, we intend to accelerate the payment of refunds to taxpayers by proposing the following. Allow employers to reduce PAY deductions for the settlement of tax refunds due to employees by the government. This means, Mr. Speaker, that the businesses will engage, or the government, or the government will engage the businesses so as to reduce deductions of PAYE from their employees once there's an agreement so that they will pay less PAYE every month. We'll allow taxpayers the right to offset tax liabilities against amounts due to them from government. And Mr. Speaker, this is a measure that we have to look into in that the government will try to speak to the private sector to offset what is due to the private sector to offset it against taxes owed to the government. Other tax relief measures. Mr. Speaker, 3,169 taxpayers, businesses, mostly businesses, owed $600 million in taxes, fines, and penalties. It must be noted, Mr. Speaker, that these taxes, in the majority of cases, have been collected on behalf of employees and the government or the government of St. Lucia. In this case, in the case of, of VAT, a total of $175 million is owed in VAT and related penalties and interest due on VAT deductions. Mr. Speaker, you will agree that this amount is unacceptably high and hinders the government's ability to meet its commitments. Consideration will be given to strengthen the government's ability to collect these taxes. As it relates to the following taxes, hotel accommodation tax, PAYE, hotel accommodation tax all inclusive, withholding taxes, value added tax. I propose that all penalties, interest, and fines will be waived. If taxes are paid, by the 1st of May 2024. Mr. Speaker, we hope that these businesses that are in arrears will use this opportunity to settle all taxes to the government by May 1st, 2024, considering the fact that the, gov the businesses are keeping these taxes for the government. They have been deducted from the other sources. Withholding taxes. Contracts below 10,000. Mr. Speaker, effective July 1st, 2023, there will be no withholding tax on payments on contracts of $10,000 and below. This, this exemption will apply to musicians this exemption will also apply to musicians and other artists in the creative industries. And Mr. and Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Creative Industries is in the process of preparing a comprehensive bill for the practice of the creative industries in St. Lucia 
that will include issues related related to taxes mr speaker in helping his debt management the government will set aside some of the proceeds from the zero interest covid bonds issued under the cip program to settle high coupon interest bonds ranging from 5 to 7.5 percent when they become due in six to ten years the strategy will reduce the cost of servicing the government bonds renewable energy concessions mr speaker the threat of climate change is real and while we are not in any way contributors material contributors to that threat we do have a moral responsibility to play our part by reducing our carbon footprint commencing june 2023 i intend to place selected pv components in the zero rated category for value added tax the cost and installation of a pv system will be allowed as an income tax deductible expense claimable over a maximum two-year period other relief mr speaker our economic policies go beyond revenue generation and are also intended to assist those who justly and deservedly require assistance mr speaker effective july 1st 2023 i propose the following a rebate of one dollar per gallon on fuel for all registered fishers the modality will be finalized after discussions among representatives of the ministries of finance and agriculture and the fishing cooperatives two a one-off payment of six hundred dollars for government pensioners payable in november 2023 three a six hundred dollar increase in the one-time allowance to teachers bringing the amount to one thousand one hundred dollars to be paid to be paid in august 2023 to assist in the purchasing of teaching materials number four an extension of duty rebate on vehicles which are available to frontline workers during covid 19 to customs and correctional officers I propose, Mr. Speaker, a one-year window for the local purchase or import of these vehicles, which will end in July 2024. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I now move to budget financing. Mr. Speaker, the recurrent expenditure of $1.264 billion. Capital expenditure, 302 million. Principal re repayment, 112 million. Total expenditure, 1.856 billion. Less recurrent, re less recurrent revenue, 1.413 billion. Capital revenue, 8 million. Grants, 147 million. Total revenue, 1.568 billion. Net financing, 288 million. Represented by bonds and treasury bills, 32 million. And loans, 256 million. <clears throat> Please note, Mr. Speaker, that any additional borrowing is the reissuance of maturing securities and will not increase the debt stock. It's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that in a budget in which my government has been able to achieve such a strong economic figure, including a growth rate of 18% and a surplus on the major economic indicators, increased employment, strengthening social services i had to spend so much time 
and allocate so many resources to the issue of citizen security. This is one of the saddest contradictions facing us as a government as we prepare this budget. This budget has been presented with a mixture of pride and satisfaction at our economic management, but is laced with sadness and disappointment that our efforts have been diverted and our results have been marred by the rise in gun violence and organized criminal disruptions in our otherwise peaceful community. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, how much stronger would be our economic performance had the international, regional, and local news had not been carrying stories of senseless murders and gang-related violence in our communities. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, how much more we could allocate to our university scholarship program and the youth economy if so much of our financial resources were not drawn towards strengthening our police services, our courts, and our prison service. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, there is a small remnant of desperate political opportunists who have been trying to seize the situation in Viewfort in their misguided belief that the infractions of some misguided youth in our communities will open a door to their hopes to achieving political office. They are dancing on the notion that the marked return to economic growth, which we announced in this budget, will be drowned by the tongue-in-cheek celebrations of every news of crime in this country. In the early days, in the early days after the election, they were banking on the fact that my leadership would fail. Then they went silent when they sensed the resolve of the people to stand with their government and the tremendous level of goodwill of the population for the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Thankfully, Mr. Speaker, they are in the minority. They simply cannot accept that the vast majority of the population simply wants to work with the government to continue the country's recovery from the devastation it suffered between 2016 and 2021. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this government has shown that despite the voices of the naysayers, we are a government that has kept its promises. We have shown that promises which we made in the last budget, most of them have been fulfilled. We have shown that the, manage the management of the economy and the management of the country is in safe hands. In this budget presentation, we have shown that we have been able to manage this economy. We have navigated the country out of COVID and around the new global economic threats which have emerged since COVID. We have restored growth in our economy. We have reduced unemployment. We have provided tax relief and other benefits to workers and consumers. We have fulfilled our commitments to school children. We have returned their, lab their laptops to them, allowing them a better chance to participate in the new global economy. We have restored hope and purpose to the young people of this country. We are thankful, Mr. Speaker, and confident that the vast, the vast majority of right-thinking solutions will not allow themselves to be distracted by the agendas and noise of a self-interested minority. We are thankful for their goodwill and support. I invite all solutions to continue to work with us and join us in our broad national transformational government. I want to thank the staff of the Ministry of Finance and all the other ministries, the Ministry of, of Economic Development, that have worked with us in the preparation of this budget. I want to thank my cabinet colleagues for the support and the commitment and work they have shown to the development of St. Lucia. I want to thank the staff of the Parliament, the Speaker, 
the Deputy Speaker, and the members of the security forces for their work with us during this session. Mr. Speaker, we invite all St. Lucians to work with us as we pursue the policy objectives and programs outlined in this budget. I commend it to the people of St. Lucia and I commend it to the Honorable House. I thank you.